I think it's very fair to say that Carl Zimmer is one of the most accomplished, prolific, authoritative, and versatile science journalists working in America today. He writes a column every week for the New York Times. His work appears in Scientific American, Discover, Atlantic, Stat, Quanta Magazine. He's written 13 books, mostly about biology and medicine, but even about science tattoos. What I find most amazing about Carl is his range. He writes about neuroscience, geology, physics, anthropology, biology. And he does it all with clarity, and he does it all with authoritativeness. He's written about autism and vaccines, climate change, DNA, human intelligence, prehistoric flying squirrels. Most recently, if you saw his piece in last week's New York Times, he wrote about theories that our diplomats in Cuba who are becoming ill are the subject of a mysterious sonic weapon that's been developed. Spoiler alert, he can find no evidence of any kind of mysterious sonic weapon. So the bottom line for me is that Carl is the biggest source of continuing education about science for millions of Americans who get their science information by reading everything that he's done. So it is an extreme pleasure for me and for all of you, I think, to have Carl with us today. So please join with me in welcoming the only science journalist to have a tapeworm named after him Carl Zimmer. Carl? Um, so uh, I'm going to talk to you about fake news uh, and, and sci fake news about science. And actually, this year marks a very important anniversary in the history of fake news about science. Um, it is the 25th anniversary of Bat Boy. So the Weekly World News in 1992 reported that one uh, Dr. Ron Dillon was exploring Hell Ho Cave in West Virginia where he discovered a 10-year-old boy who was a hybrid between human and bat. Uh, he weighed 19 pounds uh, and stood two feet high. Uh, the Weekly World News went on to publish further reports to, to keep you up to date about Bat Boy. They revealed that his mother was human his father was a bat-like creature. Uh, his genealogy went all the way back to the Mayflower, apparently. Uh, he drank blood from his human victims, apparently through a crazy straw. Uh, and he lived on and on in uh, Weekly World News reports. Uh, at some point, they announced or reported that he had endorsed Obama. And, uh, and he even became the subject of an off-Broadway musical. I'm just sort of curious, how many of you recognize, have seen that picture before? So a fair number of people after 25 years. That's, that's pretty good in our, in our business. Um, in 1992, I myself was a, a science writer, and I was learning how to write about magical creatures of other sorts. Um, I started my career at Discover Magazine, um, just to give you an idea of how long ago this was. Um, this is a piece of paper that we would stick onto magazines and then we put it in something called the mail. <laughs> and then you would read it that way. And that was the only way you could read it. Um, so uh, so in, in 1992, um, I was uh, learning how to write about science uh, as a you know, junior staff member at Discover Magazine. And um, I was very interested in life and about animals and plants and how they got to be the way they are. And so for uh, quite a while I was really interested in whales. To me, whales are, are quite magical. Um, you only need to look at 
sort of the, the history of our understanding of whales to see just how baffling they can be. This is an engraving actually uh, showing um, a, a mass being performed on the back of, of a whale, which uh, where, where you can also park your, your ship if you'd like. Now, if you look inside of a whale, actually things get even stranger um, because uh, it, does, it looks like a fish on the outside, but on the inside, it's got these, all these organs of a mammal, which gives you an idea that, um, that we are actually more closely related to, to a dolphin than the dolphin is related to, say, a shark, even though they have a very similar body on the outside. So Charles Darwin was, was particularly uh, perplexed by whales, fascinated by whales, and as he was developing his theory of evolution, he th thought that he could explain why whales are so weird. Um, his idea was actually that mammals had started out on land as, as, as land mammals with legs, uh, and that they had moved into the water, and through natural selection, they had become the whales that we know of. And that's why they have this mammal anatomy on the inside and a fish-like body on the outside. Now, how exactly they took those steps, he wasn't sure. Um, he, was, uh, he, he speculated about some, having read about bears that would swim around with their mouths open. And he thought, well, maybe they could catch bugs uh, as they swam. And he actually suggested this in the first edition of The Origin of Species. And actually, Newspapers singled that out as being particularly ridiculous. So he took it out of subsequent uh, editions. So as a science writer, I was very excited to actually be uh, uh, writing at a time when, um, when the fossils, the first fossils of whales, early whales, uh, were being discovered, ones that could actually show that Darwin was uh, fundamentally right. Um, so one of the most important ones was this fossil uh, found in uh, 1996 <clears throat> called Ambulocetus. And this is Hans Tevesen, a paleontologist who found it in uh, Pakistan. And so this, this is a, a fossil with sort of key features of, of, of whales, certain things that whales only have in terms of their ear bones and other structures. But as you can see, it's got legs. And that actually incredibly is, is what it looked like. Uh, what was really exciting as a science writer was to watch how scientists were finding more and more of these walking whales. Uh, and here's just a small selection of the ones that started to come to light in the 1990s and then beyond. Um, this led to me working on my first book, At the Water's Edge, where I looked at transitions uh, uh, out of water onto dry land and then back in in the form of whales. And what's really amazing is that you, know, you could actually see in great detail what Darwin could only speculate about. <clears throat> so you could start with a terrestrial species. This is called Pachycetus 50 million years ago. And you can trace these traits on it, like the leg, the back leg, which I'm highlighting here, going from a, you know, basically kind of like a coyote-like leg to something more like an otter. Then you get to something 40 million years ago where the legs are like basically as big as a kid's legs on a body as big as a school bus. And so you can actually uh, draw a tree, kind of like what Darwin was drawing, uh, where you can, you can see that transformation. Um, and to me, you know, this was uh, as wonderful uh, a, a, a transformation with animals that were as, as marvelously hybrid as, as Bat Boy. Um, so, so I, and, and there was a, an advantage in the fact that these things were real. Um, these things really lived. They really walked and swam around on this planet. However, um, I soon discovered that <clears throat> writing about evolution meant that I got some interesting reader mail. Um, I didn't get hate mail. I got Satan mail. Um, and so what I started to, to recognize was that by writing about just writing in a straightforward way about what scientists were learning about our world, I was some hitting some very raw nerves. Uh, and I was aware of that, you know, that, that many people believed in creationism, um, but I didn't really quite appreciate just how much, um, how, how strongly they would respond to, to articles about evolution. Um, and what I discovered was that there, you know, in the 1990s, there was a, a community 
of people who basically kind of reinforce each other's beliefs about the way the world was and sort of all work together to kind of systematically um, deny what science was revealing about the world. And they might call themselves creation scientists, they might say they, they uh, believed in intelligent design, but in any case, um, they were rejecting what biology was, was revealing. Uh, and you, know, you can see that this is not an insignificant part of our country. Um, <clears throat> so I started working uh, as a science writer, sort of midway along here. Um, clearly, m my contribution to writing about evolution has not really made much of a dent that I can see, nor has anybody else's work on this. I mean, I'd like to think that maybe this is the beginning of a tremendous nosedive in this belief. Um, you know, this is a categorically false statement. Um, we know that, I mean, I wrote earlier this year about the oldest fossil of Homo sapiens, which is 300,000 years old. That's just our own species, which evolved from older species. We know this is not true, but 38% of, of people in the most recent polling data agree with this in the United States. Um, so, at first, I kind of felt a little bit kind of out on my own uh, as a science writer because I was writing about something that was very controversial uh, and th th where there were all sorts of claims <clears throat> to, they were trying to challenge evolution, you know, claims that there was evidence of Noah's flood and, and so on. Uh, but I got to watch other communities develop and it was kind of a, kind of a frightening thing to see. So, you know, in the early 1990s, there was, there was no um, significant vaccine denialism. There was no, there were not parents who were in any major groups who were, who were hesitating to get their children vaccinated. Um, <clears throat> there had been some controversies over vaccines ever since vaccines were first invented, but I would say that by the 1990s, it was clear that, for example, we didn't have to deal with smallpox anymore. Thank you, vaccines. Um, but that started to change uh, starting in the late 1990s. Um, and in, in large part due to a, the work of a British doctor named Andrew Wakefield, who published a paper in The Lancet where he was claiming that, uh, that after children got vaccinated with uh, the MMR vaccine for uh, measles and other diseases, um, that they developed a whole bunch of uh, very concerning uh, disorders, uh, inclu you know, disruptions of the gut, and, and even implied that uh, these vaccines might be causing autism. Now, uh, this, uh, the, the, the news handled this very poorly. You had these headlines here, you know, doctors link autism to MMR vaccination. Uh, creating a, 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 a general fear that uh, somehow vaccines could cause autism. They don't. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, Wakefield started to sort of promote this, this fear about, about the, the, the vaccines that were then in use. But it turned out uh, when some journalists really dug deeper that uh, there were all sorts of reasons to uh, not to not accept his findings. So for example, um, he had actually, uh, some of the data appeared to be fabricated. Um, the, uh, he received funding from a lawyer who was seeking clients who were gonna uh, sue vaccine manufacturers. He himself got a patent for an alternative vaccine before publishing this, none of which he disclosed. In any case, the paper was retracted finally in 2010 and he was stripped of his license. Now, uh, that was not the end of it, unfortunately. It's been 19 years since this, the paper originally came out, uh, and, we, and we still are dealing with the repercussions of this. There, there's a, there's a, there are people who uh, are, are firmly persuaded that vaccines are dangerous. Um, there is a, actually just this year, there's a, a fairly sympathetic documentary that's come out about Wakefield. Um, and Wakefield and others have actually been, been trying to, to, get, to persuade people not to get uh, vaccinated and or essentially to hesitate about it. So here's a, just a graph showing you what happened in the Somali-American community in Minnesota. Um, 
vaccine rates there uh, plummeted in the past few years, and lo and behold, they are dealing with a massive measles outbreak, which is really quite harmful to their children. Um, and there were people actively going into their community and trying to uh, spread all these, all these unfounded concerns about vaccines. So this is, so this is the kind of real impact that you can get from, uh, from basically spreading fake news that, you know, that vaccines can, can cause autism. Um, there's something that has given this kind of fake news some extra energy, I think, in the past, say, 15 years. Um, and it has to do with, with how people get their information and their news about science. It's basically, if you have to sum it up, it's the disappearance of that mailing label. Um, and I have to say that I, you know, I myself uh, was, re was quite fascinated at the beginning by how, uh, how science journalism was starting to move online, to become digitized. Uh, and I actually started up a blog uh, uh, pretty, pretty early on in the, in the world of science blogging. Um, and uh, it, was, it was quite fascinating. Um, and, and actually, you know, I ended up, um, one of the Cobley Awards I won was actually for, for blog posts that I wrote. And, and, I th and you know, I, what I was doing there was I was experimenting, writing essays, trying out things that maybe editors wouldn't be interested in. You could get comments directly from readers. Um, you could know exactly how many people were reading your blog posts. It was fascinating, I have to say. And some of my fellow uh, journalists would say, ah, you're just you know, sitting in your bed in your pajamas on, on your laptop. You're not a real journalist. This isn't real journalism. This isn't going to go anywhere. Why are you wasting your time? I, and, and essentially, I think the attitude was like, you know, like journalism has been a certain way for a long time. It's big. It's profitable. It's paper-based. How is this ever, ever, ever going to change? And why would you waste your time trying out things like blogging. Well, things did change. <laughs> and they've changed pretty, pretty drastically. Uh, and uh, and, and it's, there are a lot of reasons why things changed. Uh, and I'll just give you a, a, what I think are a couple of the major factors. Um, so basically what happened was that the, uh, the newspaper industry just collapsed. Uh, and, and you can see that in the, in the job numbers here. Um, uh, so, so up here near the peak is, is actually, coincidentally, when Wakefield, around the time Wakefield published his paper. And then you have this catastrophic drop to way below World War II levels of newspaper employment. Um, when newspapers start laying people off, uh, the first people to go are often the science section staff. <laughs> So, you know, so, so science journalism had a real uh, boom in terms of hiring jobs, science, regular science sections into the 1980s. It kind of reached a peak in 1989. It's been going downhill ever since. I don't have uh, numbers after 2013. My guess is they're no higher, probably fairly lower. Um, <clears throat> now, bloggers, you, you can't blame bloggers for this, this kind of crash. Um, what happened was that, that the newspapers uh, no longer had access to a whole lot of money. So, for example, classified ads in newspapers made tens of billions of dollars a year. It was a huge source of income. Uh, and they just could not believe that something like Craigslist could take it away from them. Um, people started to become more comfortable getting their news, reading it online rather than in paper. Uh, and you would go to places like Google or Facebook rather than to uh, the publications themselves. So, for example, you would look up, you know, news on Google. Here on Facebook, this is just, you know, somebody, you, you start to have social referrals uh, to, to get your news. And here are the ads that would otherwise have been in the newspaper. Um, it's very simple. This has been incredibly profitable for Google and Facebook because they've been able to take a lot of that money from the, the, uh, the news industry, money that used to go to the news industry, they don't have to pay a lot of the costs. Um, because basically what they're doing is that they're just uh, shuttling around articles that very often are still being written by those legacy media. 
Um, so they're taking, they're taking all the upside and not dealing with any of the downside. So the result was this, this uh, tremendous crash in the, in the value of, of newspapers. And, uh, and uh, you can see just some examples of, of some of the newspapers that have lost huge amounts of value, particularly small city newspapers, Boston, Philadelphia, Minneapolis, places like that. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, and I think that this, this has been one of the factors that has allowed uh, fake news to, to really thrive in our sort of in our cultural landscape. Now, I'm not saying that fake news is new. Uh, and we've been hearing the phrase a lot recently, but here is a here's a column from eight, uh, an article from 1890 uh, talking about fake news. Uh, the subhead is there are a lot of unconscionable rascals in journalistic circles making it sometimes difficult to ascertain true facts. I do miss these headlines. Um, and actually, there was fake news before people even used the phrase. So let me just jump back to 1800. This is actually uh, a, an article from the Albany Gazette during a pres the presidential campaign where Jefferson was running for president. A uh, gentleman who left Frederickstown last Friday informs that an account had been received there of the death of Thomas Jefferson, Esquire, Vice President of the United States, at his seat near Charlottesville. This report was corroborated last evening by a gentleman directly from Baltimore who says that the same account had been received there from Winchester and that it was generally believed. Um, this was basically a way to get people not to vote for Jefferson. Oh, he's dead, so I guess I can't vote for him. Um, so this, is, this, is, this kind of fake news is, is not new um, and, and uh, it, you know, may, it might have cost Jefferson the election if it had been closer. Uh, and, you know, by 1916, people were actually talking about how we'd had to have laws put in place to stop fake news. <clears throat> so, so there's something, you know, fundamental about when you have a, have a free society where people have First Amendment rights, that there's going to be an opportunity for people to just spread around stuff that just isn't true and, and to do so for a lot of ulterior motives. But the thing is that I think that the, the structure the, the, that we, where news exists now uh, really fosters fake news in a way that just did, wasn't true before. You know, we, we, we are in this media network um, largely dominated by Facebook um, where you have social referrals, you have a frictionless distribution, you know, you don't have to wait for things to come from the printer. Um, you have algorithms that automatically raise engagement without really evaluating what these posts are. Um, so this is how you get pranksters in Macedonia to, uh, to get as much readership as, as major news organizations. And to talk about science in particular, I really want to, I want to take a really extreme case. I want to take the case of, you know, as fake as fake news can get in science. The Earth is flat, okay? Um, <clears throat> the Verge published a wonderful article recently that uses the idea of the flat Earth um, as a way to show just how prone um, our, our network, our global network is now to spread fake news about science. There's, there's been a flat earth society for decades, and I remember as a kid, I once discovered that it existed, and I actually wrote a way to get one of their pamphlets, because I just, I was amazed that there were people that actually believed that the earth was flat. They lived, you know, the flat earth society was in some little town in, I think, in Arizona someplace, and that was it. Um, but, but now you can be in a little town in Arizona, and you can reach the world. Um, and there has actually been this bizarre kind of spate of news and you know, large-scale attention to, to the belief that the Earth is flat. It's being covered by places like The Atlantic, by The Guardian, by Mike. Uh, and how does this happen? Well, the way it happens is that somebody, you know, on, on some Reddit forum starts, you know, talking about, about uh, hey, there's this Flat Earth Society, or hey, here's some evidence from the Flat Earth Society that, that the Earth is flat. And someone else says, oh, that's ridiculous. And someone says, oh, I don't know, well, maybe. And they make some jokes about it or whatever. So the more discussion there is about it, you know, there, will be, uh, there will be upvoting in Reddit. And so now this, this discussion about the Flat Earth uh, rises to the top of Reddit, which gains it more attention. 
And then journalists start to take notice. Now it's news. Uh, and so journalists start writing explainers about the, you know, why do people believe the Earth is flat. Um, then that news goes on to Facebook and where people share it more. Um, and uh, then, you know, uh, newsrooms are sort of keeping track of each other. You know, they're using programs like uh, CrowdTangle, for example, to track each other's uh, 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 readership. And it's really astonishing. Um, the, the site uh, CNET, um, they, they did an article about f the flat earth, and it got 16 times more traffic than an average post, 16 times more. Live science, they have science in, the, in, the, <laughs> in their name, uh, 11 times more traffic than average. And so actually, uh, the Flat Earth Society wrote a letter to Yahoo News, Yahoo News, which also covered this, and they wrote, their letter was to thank them. They said, thank you. They said, quote, every article like this spreads our message to more unaware minds. So you might say, oh, it's just some fun. It's just entertaining. Um, until actually you meet somebody who actually believes that the Earth is flat. I, I actually have. And it's kind of a disturbing conversation you have with them. <laughs> and they're, 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 they'll tell you, like, oh, I've seen YouTube videos. I know the truth. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, and the problem is that also that you know, this, when you have these flare-ups with news, like, it kind of gets baked in. So if you go to Google and, and you type in, you know, is the Earth flat, you get these sorts of responses. And it's a mix of good and bad. So it's great that popular science is the top hit. Um, you know, 10 easy ways for your, to tell yourself the Earth is not flat. Um, the, the, but right below it, let me go back, whoops. Right below it is frequently asked questions from the Flat Earth Wiki from the Flat Earth Society. That's number two. Okay, so you're basically say, you're gonna to be told about the shape of the Earth from the Flat Earth Society. Google tells you that this is the place to go to. Uh, and you have other things, some of which are sort of like ironic kind of takes on the whole Flat Earth thing, and at the bottom there is an ad from the Flat Earth Society, which you can barely tell is an ad. So then, so, so this is a sort of a corruption of basic scientific knowledge that you get thanks to the way that, um, that journalism and science communication in general works these days. Um, and the problem is that, um, that, you know, like by sort of indulging in, in this kind of thinking and, this sort of, and, and, you know, conspiracy theory type thinking, um, you start, what happens is that, um, well, the goal of it is, as one sociologist put it, is, is, quote, to prove that nothing is provable and that all assertions are arbitrary. So the more of the stuff that you get online, um, the less that people, can, people start to appreciate how science actually works, that science can actually tell you things about how the world works. It's provisional. You can learn, discover that old ideas were wrong, but you can replace them with better ideas. Um, Today, uh, global warming is very much uh, coursing through this network, and our collective understanding, I think, is really being harmed by it. The basic physics of global warming have been known since the 19th century. There, there are scientific debates about global warming, but mainly they're about, well, how bad are things going to get as we continue to put more carbon in the atmosphere? And that's a hard question, partly because how much carbon we put in the atmosphere is up to us. So it's not just physics, it's social science. It's a, it's a hard problem. Um, but there are, uh, but there are, but there are, the, the basics are, are fairly straightforward. And scientific societies, like the Royal Society and the National Academy of Sciences, they put these things out there online in very straightforward formats for people to find. Um, this, is a, this is a report that you can, can find online quite easily if you want to look for it. Now, the, the, so what, so what, do we, what, are the, what do people think about global warming as, as opposed to, say, uh, evolution? Um, at first glance, things look pretty good. This is actually some very recent data from this summer. And you can see that 74% of people overall agree there is solid evidence that the average temperature on the, on the Earth has been getting warmer. Um, 
like that is just objectively true. So, so you know, it would be nicer if, if it was higher than 74%. Um, and, but if you drill down deeper, uh, you start to get to see some interesting patterns. So, uh, so with people who are Democrat and lean Democrat, it's gone from 79% to 92%. People who are uh, Republican have gone from 59% down to 34. They've gone back up to 52, but still it's a much, uh, much lower number than, than the ones who are Democrat or lean Democrat. Now this is just, is the planet getting warmer? Which, like the graph I showed you, and many graphs from other data uh, sets like it show, yes, it is. It has been, it's a, it's a steady trend. There's, that's not something to be debating about. Now, what scientists also agree with overwhelmingly is that the main source of that increase in temperature is human activity. Uh, and those scientific societies I showed you, and many others, American Meteorological Society, they have just come out and said, like, all our evidence points to human activity being the overriding cause of the increase in, this, in temperature. Uh, a lot of people still think that it's natural patterns. And so even though, uh, and so even the, uh, while the GOP currently, there's a slight majority that accept that the planet's getting warmer, only 24% actually accept that humans are responsible. <clears throat> so I think that you can ascribe a lot of this to that network I was talking to you about. Um, so these networks, um, they are organized around our friends. They're also organized around people who think the way we do. Um, so uh, if people are liberal, they often get a lot of their information from other people who have liberal views. People who are conservative may get it from conser like-minded conservative people. Uh, and so scientists have actually been trying to map out how people of different uh, political uh, persuasions, how they share information, where they go to for their information, and, and, and where they, how they, they trade things with each other and how these particular websites you know, make reference to what's on other websites. And you get, a, you get something like this where blue is towards the, the liberal side and red is towards the conservative side. Um, this is a study just on 2016 because they're interested in what happened during the election and the campaign. Um, they found that liberals tend to share items about equally from centrist sites and far left sites, um, conservatives, uh, have almost no interest in centrist sites whatsoever. They only share items from extremely partisan sites. Uh, and Breitbart, which is that big red thing in the, in, in the center of that red cloud, has a very powerful effect there. Breitbart may not seem like it gets a lot of uh, readers uh, compared to other sites, but when you look at it this way, uh, as part of a network, it takes on a very large importance. Uh, now, these networks can also be connect uh, to politicians as well. And so what we're having right now is, is a situation where um, some politicians are trying to uh, uh, shape the, the way that people get their news um, as, about science. So Lamar Smith, who's the chairman of the House Committee of Science, Space, and Technology, has been um, been uh, 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 speaking out a lot, com accusing climate scientists of, of uh, very unsavory kind of activities, claiming that they are publishing things that are not, uh, claims that are not supported by the evidence, and so on and so forth. Um, during a congressional hearing, someone mentioned uh, actually an article from Science Magazine, um, which is published by AAAS. Um, uh, it was written by Jeff Mervis, who is a, a veteran science reporter, uh, been, been writing for years about science policy. And in this congressional hearing, uh, Smith declared, that is not known as an objective writer or magazine. I mean, Science Magazine is the leading uh, science journal in the country um, and has a large team of independent uh, reporters who have been writing for decades and doing uh, some of the best reporting out there. So in, 
in congressional hearings, he is trying to get people to believe that science news is fake news. Meanwhile, uh, he, uh, under his leadership, the committee, committee has been promoting news about climate, in particular, from none other than Breitbart. Uh, and so recently, uh, they uh, went on Twitter and on their website uh, promoting a story which falsely claimed that global temperatures are crashing. Um, th this was a total misreading of, of the actual science. Um, this article in Ars Technica um, really summed it up nicely. It said, um, the article was written by James Dellingpole, a columnist who has made a career out of insult-laden polemics against climate science. In an episode of BBC's Horizon, Dellingpole famously admitted that he never reads scientific papers and called himself, quote, an interpreter of interpretations. In this case, Dellingpole mostly tacked a few put-downs onto quotes from a Daily Mail story written by David Rose, who also has a long history of writing deeply misleading stories about climate science. So this is what uh, the chairman of the House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology is singling out to draw people's attention to. This is what he considers legitimate reporting about climate science. This is a serious problem. Um, another problem uh, with our media landscape is that um, it, 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 it feeds off of our emotions. You know, we see something, we get emotional, we get angry, we get outraged, and, and we hit the button. Um, and so it is, it is, it is actually a, a really cunning kind of design for engagement. So places like Facebook and Google, like, they really thrive because we're reading these things and we're looking at them quickly and friends are sharing them with us and we want to share them with someone else, say, like, you know, things like, can you believe this? And actually researchers uh, have, have done experiments where they actually show that uh, you, you register outrage much more easily when you get information online. You, you just get angrier. You just respond more to it. Um, so, so, you know, we're, we're, the, we're the rat pressing the lever um, when, it, when we're on things like Facebook. And you can get more information about this, this recent paper called Moral Outrage in the Digital Age. Um, a really unfortunate example of how this happens uh, had ju just happened recently um, in the wake of, her of Hurricane Maria hitting Puerto Rico. Um, <clears throat> this is a horrible catastrophe. I um, mean, there's still, uh, people are still, a lot of people still don't have power. Uh, I think it's the latest figures were something like 85% of people don't have power. A third of people still don't have drinking water. It's been 22 days. So things are getting desperate there. That's bad enough. Now, about a, a few days after the hurricane hit, a, uh, a tropical disease specialist named Peter Hotez wrote a piece online warning about cholera, saying we should be worried about cholera breaking out in Puerto Rico. Uh, it has been a very long time since that's ever happened. And Hotez was saying, look, this, this is this might happen, and here, here are the reasons why it might happen. I mean, basically, the bacteria would have to be introduced to the, to the island, uh, and to the, uh, to dirty, and if it got into to contaminated water supplies, uh, we could be looking at a big problem, in the same way that Haiti has had a terrible cholera problem. He was saying, like, this is something to be concerned about and to be on our guard about, which is a, a very responsible thing to say. Somehow, though, Within a couple days, I'm not, I still don't know quite how this happened, a rumor started to spread around, especially on Twitter, that cholera was in Puerto Rico. Uh, there was a tweet where someone said, the first cases of cholera have been reported in Puerto Rico. There was no sourcing on that, nothing. It just, and boom, it just took off. Uh, and unfortunately, Paul Krugman, uh, a New York Times uh, opinion columnist and a Nobel Prize winner, uh, went along with it. He said cholera in the U.S. territory among U.S. citizens in the 21st century. Heck of a job, Trumpy. Now there he is echoing uh, George Bush saying heck of a job, Brownie, referring to the director of FEMA in, uh, the, uh, ap in her after Hurricane Katrina. Well, uh, this was just was not true. 
This, this, this is fake. Um, and later, um, he uh, added another tweet in response to saying, okay, cholera not confirmed, conjunctivitis, yes, lack of clean water, situation we're seeing not moving makes it a risk, but not certain. I have to say that's not good enough. It's not that cholera is not confirmed. There are no reports of cholera in Puerto Rico. Thank goodness. And, you know, like that could change and it'll be horrific if it does. So this is not really a great uh, full-throated uh, um, sort of retraction. Um, he did, you know, and again, in fairness, he, uh, there's a, he uh, responded to readers and, 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 and said about his tweet, I got sloppy um, and, and owned up to it, which, which is good. I'm glad he did. The problem is that sloppiness um, just has a way of sticking around uh, and people can make use of it. So, um, and what happens is that these things will ricochet around that network I told you about. So, uh, so Newsbusters, which is dedicated to exposing and combating liberal media bias, uh, has a headline, fake news. New York Times Krugman tweets, cholera outbreak in Puerto Rico. Heck of a job, Trumpy. Uh, there was a lot of this online, um, and uh, it also reached uh, it also reached the the notorious uh, forum known as 4chan, uh, and I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with 4chan. And the, for those of you who aren't, it's a place that deals, uh, among other things, with um, conspiracy theories and racist memes, and played a, an important role uh, in this this last election. Um, so I'm going to show you this next slide. I'm not going to not going to do it, uh, give it the respect of actually reading it, but uh, it's an obscenity-laden post uh, using this tweet as a way of, of uh, attacking Krugman for being Jewish, for and attacking liberal media in general. Um, I don't even know if this is a real person. <laughs> You know, this could, I mean, I, I, I would not be in the least surprised if this was, you know, some professional troll in St. Petersburg. Who knows? Uh, you know, he, this is the one uh, post that he has ever contributed to 4chan. I, you know, this is just, this is just uh, high-level trolling. But again, it, it sort of, it, it helps to pollute this science communication environment that we, that we really depend on. When I saw this, when I first saw this, I, and I saw it from other people too, I just, I decided that I was going to start responding to this uh, as much as I could. So I replied to him and to others and just said, there's no evidence of cholera on Puerto Rico. This is, you, you need to take this back. And a lot of other people did, did, were saying this. And some of my fellow science writers, we basically spent like an afternoon trying to squash this. Um, and um, it worked okay, but not really. I mean, I felt like we were, you know, had a very small hose to put out a big fire. And you can sort of see that by how often the initial one got retweeted and how often his follow-up did. <laughs> so you've got 32,777 uh, people saying, uh, retweeting this thing like, oh my God, there's cholera. And only 599 retweeting like, oh, no cholera. And you can still go on Twitter and find people saying, oh my gosh, there's, there's cholera in Puerto Rico. Um, this is kind of a, sorry, kind of a text heavy slide, I apologize. But, but um, th there's a recent survey that, uh, that kind of shows how all the things I've been talking to you about sort of lead to a feeling that, well, a lot of things just aren't um, understood scientifically, or there's a debate. Um, and, and, you know, so, so what happened was that Pew Research did a poll and they said, you know, if you've ever watched, read, or listened to science news stories that report on a disagreement among scientific experts, what, what topics were there? Were there? The top one is climate change, 32%. And somebody talking about how they saw John Stossel interviewing two scientists who disagreed about the extent of man-made climate change. Then you have 8% for medicine and health, um, vaccines, hello. Um, the debate in space, interesting, is, is whether or not Pluto is a planet. Um, I guess that's the best we could do for space and astronomy. Um, 
food and nutrition, the ongoing GMO debate, um, which uh, is not really a scientific debate, uh, and then 5% way down there, my old favorite, you know, the evolution and creation debate. So there I was, you know, um, thinking that evolution and creation in the 90s was really the only thing where you would, you would get caught in the middle of these battles, but um, it's really gotten pushed down by all of these other things. Um, so I just want to just spend the, the last you know, part of my talk um, trying to pull my little plane here out of this little death spiral I put you into. <laughs> um, I'm actually somewhat optimistic. Um, and the reason I'm optimistic is that, um, well, there, there are several reasons for it. Um, there, I think people are recognizing the problem. I think we've sort of been thrust into this new way of getting uh, news about science. And I think that people are starting to figure out that it doesn't take care of itself, that it, it needs care and feeding. And so to begin with, uh, digital literacy is becoming a thing. Um, and I believe here at Stony Brook, there's, you know, there, there are uh, actually courses on, on digital literacy. I think this should start, I mean, as the father of uh, two teenage kids, I think this needs to start at like age eight. Um, because, you know, kids are doing their research online and they assume that whatever pops up on their phone is, uh, through Google is true. And so they end up at the Flat Earth Society. Uh, and so they, they need to understand that um, they need to be careful consumers. Um, I also think that Facebook and Google somehow need to be forced to take far more responsibility for what they are letting flow through their channels. They're making many billions of dollars. Surely they could afford a little editorial oversight. Another reason that I'm kind of optimistic is that um, people really like science. They just do. Uh, and we kind of forget that sometimes when we're focused on all those debates. But here again is some, some you know, piping hot new survey data. Um, what, you know, percentage of adults who say they're interested in th things as a news topic. And there's science news coming in number three. Uh, Seventy-one percent, either somewhat or very interested in, coming in above business, finance news, coming in above sports, coming in above entertainment news. Uh, could you imagine maybe like uh, in, instead of all the entertainment news and you know People and Us Weekly and so on at the the uh, checkout counter, that there were science magazines there instead? I know it's a bit of a stretch, but still. <laughs> The fact is that, that people say that they are interested. Uh, and I certainly have found that in my experience writing at the New York Times, um, that my stories at the New York Times are uh, where I won the other uh, Cavalier Awards that uh, Howard was talking about. And, um, you know, there they, uh, you know, while other science sections and other newspapers have been struggling or being shutting down, it's been really nice that the New York Times has been uh, really supporting this, their science reporting. Um, and I think part of it is that they can kind of see that um, people are interested. So here's just one example. This is a story I wrote uh, last year about the Tree of Life. Got a lot of attention through social media, which I suppose I'm being self interest in saying that's a good thing this this, this time <laughs> um, but in any case uh, it translated into a lot of views a lot of emails you know and it, you know this is a story that's about the tree of life that is competing with stories about politics and sports and business and all the rest of it um, now there's also a lot of room for improvement people don't actually uh, get a lot of science news. Uh, this is a kind of a pretty crowded chart, but the, the basic point is that, um, you know, only about a third of people get uh, science news a few days a week or more. So, uh, so you've got people who are really interested in science, but they're not getting a lot of it. So why not? We, we need to figure out those reasons and make the most of it. We need to capitalize on that. Um, now, there are some, some experiments that people are using, and I've been involved with some of them, which I think are really interesting. So, for example, uh, Mosaic is a publication put out by a foundation called the, the Wellcome Trust in England. It's about medicine. And um, 
so they support their, their writers with, uh, with foundation money. And then what they do is they basically give a Creative Commons license. Basically, they, they, they're telling people, please, reprint our articles wherever you want. So I wrote an article about allergies, and uh, it just went all over the place. I wrote another article about blood types. It went to a whole different set of places. Um, and so that's amplifying. That's getting in, in front of a lot of more eyeballs. So that's a good thing. Um, places like BuzzFeed, which you might associate with uh, kitten videos or listicles, they actually are investing in a big science desk of their own. Uh, another reason for optimism is that there are lots of other um, ways of communicating about science. So Vox, for example, has been doing some videos, uh, and this, look, this is about evolution. This is, this is, this is, and it's you know, proof of evolution that you can find on your body. Over 26 million views. That's good. And you know, I, I could, you know, if I could figure out how to how to capture an image of, uh, of, of of a news story on Snapchat, which my daughters are promising me we'll we'll figure it out at some point. I could show you that. I mean, so news news uh, organizations are getting onto Snapchat as well. I walk in and find my 14-year-old daughter just you know reading something like from the Wall Street Journal just on Snapchat, and and I'm startled. Uh, <laughs> But I'm intrigued, and, and that's part also what gives me some hope. Um, finally, um, I think that another way that we can get more real news about science to the people who want it is to, to, to try to understand audiences better. It's very easy to caricature readers to caricature people who, do, who, uh, who reject certain kinds of science or accept others. Uh, and a lot of times our intuitions, and I'm saying our intuitions as reporters, can be false. So uh, Dan Kahan at Yale Law School has been doing uh, lots of interesting research on this. And um, it's a little hard to read here, but his website is culturalcognition.net. Um, <clears throat> and just to give you one example, he, so he, he does lots of surveys and lots of polls and so on. And so he, he says, do you agree or disagree with this? There's solid evidence that recent global warming due mostly to human activities such as burning fossil fuels. And he basically sort of draws a graph. And he, he, measure, and he, he gives people's quizzes about their knowledge of science. And so he can measure their ordinary science intelligence. And it kind of looks like, well, you kind of think like, well, I guess that's what I'd expect, like the more scientific science intelligence people have, the more likely they are to agree with that statement. Um, but if you pull it out and sort of look at, well, how do people, what are people's uh, self-identity? How do they think of themselves? It gets very different. So uh, conservative Republicans with very high science intelligence are actually more likely to reject that, um, whereas it's the opposite for liberal Democrats. So, so um, you can have a liberal Democrat who really doesn't know science at all and, and is totally convinced that global warming is real and caused by humans, and then a conservative Republican who really knows a lot of science and rejects it. So you, you need to bear that in mind, and you need to ask yourself, well, what's going on? How are people's ideas of their, their self-identity and their understanding of science interacting? Um, and what's Interesting is you get different kinds of curves for different issues. So here's like, you've got global warming, gun possession, fracking, nanotechnology. Sometimes people agree, sometimes they don't. It's, it's, a, it's a complex pattern, and I think that we as science journalists need to, to understand that better so that, we're not, so that we're not alienating people and so that we're actually finding ways to connect with readers more. Uh, and the answer to connecting with people is not just saying like, oh, well, just people need more information. That, that's, information's good, I love it, but, um, but you need more than that. You know, and part of what you need are stories. And that brings me back uh, at the end of my talk to, to Bat Boy again. A few years ago, uh, Vice uh, interviewed the artist who did Bat Boy. And it was really, uh, I found it really fascinating. Uh, and so one of the questions was, um, why do you think Bat Boy became so influential? And so remember, this is like several years before the election and before people started like wondering what's going on with how people are feeling in our country and so on. And, and, and he, it feels quite prophetic when you read it now. 
He says, the face just connects. People see themselves in him. I imagine millions of people who may feel the same way that I do. They see emotion in the face. It says, get me out of here. Look at the shape of the world is in. Maybe it needs Bat Boy to straighten it out. Maybe he reflects the deep down feelings of millions, if not billions of people on this planet. With everything, we're slaves. I think it's more true than it was then. I see these kids suffering, working these nickel and dime jobs with no insurance. In my day, we could, we could move up. I see these kids working these same jobs five years later. So there's something about Bat Boy uh, that Dick Culpa believes speaks to a lot of people. And, and you know, Bat Boy has endured as an, as an image. And, and there's, there's almost like there's a, the story of Bat Boy has <laughs> as well. So as strange as it seems, I actually really do believe that, um, that one of the things we can do is we can, in order to deal with fake news and to bring more science to, to more people, is to learn some lessons from Bat Boy. So thank you very much. And I believe we have time for questions. And there are microphones over here. Thank you.